everyone. Uh, my name is Leslie Quo. I'm the Associate Director of Development and Alumni Relations. And I'm pleased to welcome everyone to the second session of the Global Symposium organized by the MSAAD Class of 2006. In this morning's session, we heard from practitioners in the UAE, India, and Taiwan as they presented award-winning solutions to social, environmental, and cultural factors important to their communities. This session, we will hear from studios in Boston, New York, and Miami in the United States, and various cities in Greece, Spain, Germany, and Portugal. Rachel Rodham will be moderating this session. She is the founding director and studio of Futurist, uh, leading Modu, Modu since its founding in 2012. Rachel directed the design of many projects, including the Cloud Seating Plaza Pavilion and the Heart Squared Public Artwork. Along with Fu Huang, she was awarded the 2017 Founders Rome Prize in Architecture since 1897 and an annual prize to those who represent the highest standards of excellence in the arts and humanities. She has also been awarded the Emerging Voices Award from the Architectural League of New York and the US Japan Creative Artist Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. Rachili holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Technion in Haifa and a Master's in Advanced uh, architectural design from Columbia, of course. Um, she currently teaches in Rhode Island School of Design and recently at MIT. Raj, fellow of the American Academy in Rome, a licensed architect in Israel, and at LEEB, a lead accredited uh, professional in building design and construction. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the second session of the Global Symposium of the Class of 2006. I would like to thank Johnny Chu for organizing the event and for the support of GSAP. My name is Angeli and I will be moderating the session. And on behalf of my colleagues and friends, uh, it's good to be back, even virtually, and connect with a new generation of students, with the faculty and the public. Uh, this past year has been a year of reflection for all of us, uh, just in time for our own 15 year anniversary. It is a great opportunity to look back on our work as individuals and as a collective. This afternoon's session will include 10 presenters, uh, 10 presentations, seven minutes each. And if we are all on time and we're going to do it, uh, we will have a QA and a uh, session at the end. Um, awkwardly enough, I'm going to start this uh, sharing my screen. Just a moment. Okay. So I'm taking my own time, seven minutes. Okay. So I'm a co-founder of Modu along with Fu Wang, who teaches right now at, uh, at GSAP. Uh, Modu is an interdisciplinary architecture and design practice based in Brooklyn, New York. Our practice aims to connect humans to cities and nature through rethinking the relationship between the built and natural environments and between urban to interiors. The knowledge that we build in the office allow us to work in multiple typologies. I will present today two projects that show different engagement with the environment. Cloud Seeding was a winner of an invited competition by the, by the Design Museum Cholon in Israel. The project rethinks the boundaries between the build and the nature through harnessing and visualizing the forces of wind. You can see on the left image the Cholon Design Museum that designed by Ron Arad with an abandoned city square in front of it. Barren due to the extreme heat and strong deflections that are common in the Middle East. We were invited to provide ideas on how to reactivate the square. The basic idea was to provide a place with a shade. A shade that is provided by 30,000 balls deployed on a roof structure, balls in three different sizes to encourage their movement with the, brain, with, the, with the breeze. This image represents a scenario out of many, working with scenarios rather than with fixed conditions. Usually, shade changes with the sun orientation while the object itself is still. 
In this case, the shade is a combination of movement of a Mediterranean light breeze and sun orientation. A thin upper landscape provides architecture as a pure manifestation or, of environmental forces. Sorry. Uh, we used ready-made greenhouses structures that are typology that, uh, typologies that is typical to the Israeli landscape and we deployed a thin mesh layer on top that allows for rain to go through, but keep the balls moving throughout. The most challenging part of the design is to make the suspended mesh ceiling completely aligned to allow for a free movement of the balls from one side to another. We didn't design the programs below, instead allowing it to be flexible outdoor room in the city used by the museum for different programs and by the residents themselves, or even for children to just play with a ball. The project was designed for variable scenarios and condition, but not for specific programs, creating an architecture modified by weather but not vice versa. These are strategies that comes from landscape architecture deployed into an architectural project. As such, inter interdisciplinary approach is also through borrowing strategies of design from different disciplines. The second project that I'll show is under construction, a, a ground up building in Houston. Promenade is a retail and office center focused on visitors' experience. It was designed pre-COVID, but it's quite relevant to our times. Working with limited budget, we removed any decorations and symbols associated with the typology. Instead, we proposed to the developer to invest in 2% of the site area to become a green threshold. These green thresholds are designed for human well-being, allowing for direct access to local natures. Each unit is designed for a mini garden, garden that extends horizontally and vertically with a unique microclimate and unique plants. Rock garden, tall grass garden, garden for pollinators, and a desert garden. Promenade connects multisensorial environments. Extending the store to include both interiors and exteriors as part of the identity of the place and for their experience of the users. We also bake in the office as part of our research. In this case, we bake concrete panels and photograph them with thermal camera. To conduct research on which 3D corrugated wall patterns will allow for the accumulation, of, uh, will allow for accumulated heat to be released quicker. We call them as self-cooling walls. We, we deploy different wall patterns along the building depending on sun orientation. The architecture elements of promenade Building envelope, vertical fins, shading canopies, and corrugated wall patterns are all designed to allow for a variety of outdoor thermal comfort. The project is scheduled to finish construction this year. Thank you. Okay, uh, next I would like to, I did I stop sharing? Uh, yeah, I stopped sharing, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, next, I would like to present Amir Creeper. Amir is the founding principal of Creeper Studio that is based in Boston, working with commercial real estate and institutional clients nationwide. Amir most recently taught at Northeastern University. Thank you so much, Raheli, for the introduction. I'll share my screen. Everybody can see that? So 15 years ago, 2006, it was a strange time. Uh, after the excitement of graduation from the AID, uh, I felt myself I was trapped in a labyrinth, quite frankly. It was a rough time. Uh, on a personal note, 
I broke up with my girlfriend for a long time. I, uh, I didn't have a job lined up when I finished Columbia and I had student debt. So I was pretty stressful um, and I didn't know what to do, but I was lucky enough that um, I was able to land a job early on in May, New York. Um, and I started to work for Polshek. For those of you who don't know, Polshek was the dean at Columbia uh, between the late 70s and uh, mid 80s, just before Chumi. And it was a really interesting experience. Uh, it was a large office, um, like 185 people at the time, uh, which very interesting work, a lot of um, attention to details, technology. Um, but for me, I was interested in the operation of a large office that gets to build in New York, uh, which sounds easy, but uh, it's a fairly complex endeavor. And after spending time at Columbia, I really wanted to understand what does it take to get things built on a very difficult environment. And I was able to see that, and it was an amazing experience. Um, by the end of the year, 06, I realized that I didn't wanna stay in New York for the long term. Uh, I didn't have the work, the right work-life balance that I was aiming. Um, so by February 07, uh, I moved to Boston, where I'm still, I'm here after 15 years. Um, and I started to work for a firm called Machado and Silberi. At the time, uh, Jorge Silberi was the chairman of the GSD. Uh, and the office was about 45 people, just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, and it was really interesting environment, very different, much more academic, uh, a lot of conversations, discussions. Um, we were able to um, work internationally. I was immediately given a lot of responsibility. Um, this project I'm going to show really briefly, and actually this is across the board. I'm going to just show a slide. Uh, it's almost like I was thinking 15 years, 15 slides. So uh, really a snapshot of uh, what I was doing year by year, but in a slide almost. So this is a very large development we did in Cairo, west of Cairo, with a very complex program that includes hotel, residences, um, a lot of urban design. Um, and it was extremely interesting to work in, in a completely different um, country, culture, and coordinating that with another architect. It was an amazing experience. Um, after that, this is a different uh, change of space and scale. Uh, this is in Wisconsin, in Madison. It was an addition to um, a modernist museum for the um, uh, university. Uh, you see on the right side, an existing building from the 60s, and an addition on the left side uh, for the Chazen Museum of Art. And Machan Silberi had uh, an incredible attention to craftsmanship. Um, again, detailing, it's one of the most things that we spend time on and uh, understanding, uh, you know, um, the existing conditions and developing a dialogue between the old and the new. So I spent there about four or five years. And at that time, I realized it was a good time to take a risk and start my own studio, my own shop. I didn't have kids. Um, I didn't have a mortgage, didn't have a wife, so I said, why not? Uh, and that was uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, I started my own practice here in Boston. And at the beginning, the projects were small interiors, uh, bakeries, shops, restaurants. Funny enough, we were selling drawings. I know it sounds weird, but that's what we were doing. Uh, we were selling drawings uh, for different uses. And... Um, and then the project grew, grew in complexity and scope. Like the owners of those stores, those restaurants, hired us to do some exterior space, plazas, outdoors. Um, and then in 2014, we got a commission to do a very large building, which is uh, the Sears Crescent Building. It's a landmark in Boston, the oldest commercial building in Boston that survived urban renewal from the 60s. This is a very well-known building in downtown. It's an entire building that we got to renovate. And instead of adding to the building, the idea was to remove from the building. So we didn't add, we just removed layers and layers of stucco, sheetrock tiles, stuff that was added to the building. And that's something that we kind of, you know, develop as a part of the office, being critical of what we add. And in some cases, an architect, it's about removing. There's nothing to add. The building itself can speak for itself and it's about revealing the original building, the original beauty. Um, 
again, a lot of interiors we were doing. Uh, this is uh, also downtown in Boston, working with um, a brutalist building from the 60s and, and trying to understand geometries and reconfigure them, creating uh, buildings that they are uh, for new users. In this case, a technology company that was moving the headquarters to Boston. Um, this is an interesting project, a fun project in a way. It's a dispensary uh, for marijuana use. Uh, our client got the first uh, license for recreational marijuana in Massachusetts. So uh, they wanted to have a flagship store. And the idea here was um, similar to other projects, there was an existing building that was dilapidated and we decided to preserve it and keep it and become a beacon for the brand. We came up with all the branding, graphics, and so forth. And that was very interesting as an experience that created uh, their own brand, and we were part of that. Um, so that gives you an idea of the last 15 years, what I've been doing in the office. Uh, we work with basically a lot of existing buildings that we restore. Uh, in this case, it's a residential building behind MIT from 90, uh, like 120 years ago. And we kept the interior shell, and the whole building was uh, renovated to the studs and we have some graphics and key moments where we kind of mark that this building has been renovated but besides that it's our restoring and revealing the interior of the building um, and besides working hard uh, we have also been busy at the uh, at home I have three kids I have a <laughs> wife and uh, I'm happy to report that things are pretty well even besides COVID uh, so I'm really glad to reconnect with everybody and I'm hoping that you know, next time we see each other is in person and uh, we don't have to wait to our 20th reunion. We could do it perhaps even sooner. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Um, next, I would like to introduce Steven Morale. Steven is a practicing architect and adjunct professor based out of Miami and Colombia. His office plus works on mixed use, multifamily, commercial and high-end residential projects. Hi everyone, how's it going? <laughs> So I'm trying to share the screen. Okay. Let's see. Hi everyone, I'm Steven. Um, so I'm originally from Columbia, South America, uh, but I grew up in South, in South Florida, in Miami. Uh, I'm actually currently in Bogota at the moment. I went to school at SARC uh, in California and I have a master's from University College London, uh, Bartlett. Uh, and I also graduated from Columbia University. Uh, so I've been around uh, at pretty good schools. Um, and so a couple of years ago, basically we started our, our firm called PLUS, originally called uh, uh, Planning Logistic Urban Solutions. Uh, short, we called it PLUS. We do architecture planning and design. At PLUS, we love to solve. We like to uh, make special places. We strive for construction exper expertise. Uh, we love innovating. <clears throat> we love collaborating as well. Uh, we work as architects of record sometimes with a couple of firm, uh, well-known firms as well. Uh, we have a very inductive approach to design and um, we make very efficient decisions in terms of our design. Uh, we strive to concentrate on the solutions, not on the problem necessarily. So um, here's a couple of sample projects. This is uh, one of the first ones called Sembrit, uh, which was a competition. Uh, we were trying to extrapolate some ideas from the grid of the city and kind of uh, merge technology. This is a competition uh, that <laughs> incorporated a railroad station um, and incorporated a bus station as well. And basically, we tried to use the panels to kind of uh, merge everything together. Uh, and, and different parts of the city. So the, that first part was the track. Uh, this was uh, kind of like the bus station at the, at the very top. Um, this was uh, some connecting bridges in between uh, the different parts of the project uh, using the different panels and different te technology. Um, and this is the overall kind of uh, design that we were doing. Uh, again, merging the entire, the entire site, which is very sporadic. It even had a building uh, that was uh, detached from, from the, the station itself. Um, here's another competition that we did in South America, in Colombia. Uh, this was in Villa Vicencio, uh, which is a smaller city close to Bogota. Uh, basically, this was uh, an elementary school, um, and the elementary school had uh, the different classrooms, open, open spaces. Uh, it had uh, more communal uh, basketball courts uh, that were open. Uh, it had the soccer fields in the back. It had uh, enclosed basketball courts as well. The interesting thing about this project is that obviously during the day when the elementary school was open, um, the entire the entire elementary school couldn't use the entire site. 
in the afternoon, they would actually close the doors and this portion that was more communal would be actually open to the entire community for them to use it. Uh, so it was a pretty fun project that we did. Um, in Colombia, most of the schools are designed with very passive design. So we use these uh, perforated facades uh, and kind of um, um, very green materials and, and just creating these open spaces um, within these projects. Um, we also used a lot of the typology uh, that was within the site. So there was like a river next to it and, and we kind of merged that into this particular type of design. This is another project um, in uh, Lima, Peru. This was a competition. It was called the um, uh, Mali Museum. Uh, basically this was in 2016. Interesting thing about this project is that we were using uh, local materials, local design uh, to inform the project as well. Um, some type of uh, studying like the, the, the Inca culture and, and the type of, um, I guess, um, drawings uh, to incorporate into design. The other interesting thing about their project is that um, we tried to provide very open public spaces that had statues and that people can access. So the, pu the public didn't necessarily have to go into the museum to experience the art. So we had uh, artwork uh, exposed throughout the entire thing, but we also uh, allowed the public to, to view um, basically the artwork without necessarily going into it. It also had an educational component on some, so there was a direct link between uh, the educational and, and the public sec, uh, portions. Um, and so we provided access both uh, horizontally going up to the rooftops and also sinking into the ground. And then this is a, um, an interesting project that we had uh, with a client in South Florida. So as you know, most of South Florida is very much about uh, having amazing parties, uh, outdoor spaces, uh, basically, uh, you know, enjoying nature, enjoying a lot of the green areas. And this particular client wanted to have this uh, huge bar, an existing kitchen, a 10 person pool, uh, a fireplace, um, a place to really uh, allow people to gather. Um, this particular client has three huge parties, about 300 people uh, uh, per party, uh, both for the Super Bowl, Halloween, and for uh, New Year's. So basically we were trying to create this huge cover. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is because we were trying to use kind of uh, more modern uh, design decisions, but we are also including the vernacular of Florida, which is these uh, awkward, you know, the Spanish tile roofs. And so we were trying to give it a, another look. He's very Irish. And so this is a picture of the actual, of the actual space. Um, you can see there's a lot of people. And what's interesting is the client himself actually uh, made a video. I, and we love that, you know, the, they actually enjoy this space so much. So, like I said, there's these huge parties. A lot of people know about this space. Uh, everyone's always invited. If you guys can find it on, on, on Facebook, there's all these huge invitations. Uh, and we love that the client actually loved the project so much that he did this video uh, promoting it. So it's interesting. It's about the Super Bowl, and uh, it shows the project and how it's actually occupied by people and how people appreciate it, uh, which is great. That's our client right there. <laughs> And it's really interesting because everything's interactive. Basically, we have a stage there where uh, live bands come. Uh, it's connected to the columns that light up with the with the audiovisual. Just you know, it's a f like five person bar, uh, bartender bar. Uh, <laughs> And are you playing a video? Yes. Are you guys seeing? No. I'm actually not able to see it. Maybe you can drop a link to it in the chat okay. so people can view it on their own. Okay. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure why it's not working. We had video in the last uh, session. Sorry about that. All right. No problem. All right. Um, I'll switch on to another part. Um, so another part of the practice that we've uh, we've done some consultancy. Um, basically, we connected with a firm called um, uh, Radius Track, and we've been able to work on uh, really amazing projects. This was the uh, Fine Arts Museum in Houston, uh, basically fabricating some of the pieces, uh, working through the clash detection. Uh, we also worked on the New World Symphony in Miami. Uh, oh, I for... think maybe, um, sorry, Stephen, to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, you're, you might need to restart your presentation. Oh, okay. It's the All slides right. aren't actually advancing. All right, here, I'll do it. 
Yes, you know. No, maybe you need to stop sharing and then just share again. Huh, interesting. Let me see what it is. Okay, all right. Um, so, <clears throat> like I said, we worked on uh, New World Symphony uh, in Miami, uh, basically developing the surfaces on the fabrication end, not, not necessarily on the, on the design. Uh, so we had to model every single surface uh, for this particular space. Uh, throughout the years, I've also consulted on educational projects. This was the Miami-Dade uh, Hialeah campus, uh, the overall campus working with, with Zizkovich architects. Um, I also worked as a consultant project manager on the Miami World Center, which is a huge uh, construction. This was about 700,000 square feet of mixed use uh, retail uh, and a huge amenity deck um, that is has, has started to open. Um, Steven, we're past eight project. minutes if okay. you would like to conclude, please. All right. Yeah. Uh, no, basically, uh, I've had a, a great experience and the GSAP was, uh, was an, an amazing uh, time that uh, obviously allowed us to to connect with different type of projects and different different type of firms, uh, and glad to he see you all. Thanks. Thank you, um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, your project definitely wants me uh, kind of uh, makes me want to travel again. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, our next presenters are a duo, Nicoleta Grigorudi and Roque Viejo. Roque and Nicoleta lead Kel Arquitectos, an architecture and urban design office that is based in A Coruña, Spain. Mm -hmm. They work throughout the EU. They design and also develop projects as part of their form of practicing. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Rachely. Um, I'm going to, to, to present uh, three projects, two small uh, family houses and a big scale project. And I'm not going to speak English because my uh, British accent is too strong for the American uh, culture that uh, I'm going to show just a slice and in order also to not to exceed the time. Okay. Okay, let's to share the screen. ¿Dónde lo doy? ¿Aquí? Compartido en todo, sí, no sé. Bueno, bueno, te lo dejo. ¿Do you see the, the screen? Yeah. Yes. Ok. Dale aquí. Espera, espera. Tengo que dar principio. Bueno, espera. Tú o tú. No, tú también. Tú de beginning. Okay, guys, let's go. It's gonna be a little bit weird to don't speak, but. The first one. That's the big, uh, the big scale project with a budget of 25 uh, million euros. And it's very close to home. It was a very, very big work. Okay. 
These pictures are from this morning. The second project is between us. It's in La Corse, Corsega, in France. That's a, a interesting project. We chose it because um, it's a project of back architectos. That is an office uh, from Argentina, and the clients are from Paris. The project is in Corsega, in La Corse, and the architects are Greek and but Argentinians, the designers, and the project designed by us, Greek and Spanish architects. We received this from the architects, back architects. They are very famous in Argentina, overseas. And we were there doing all the construction plans and everything. We are the office, the associate office that designed the projects in Europe. That was a work of Nicolette. And finally, is one of the last projects we are doing. Sorry, it's under construction. This is close to La Coruña, in the end of the earth, in the end of the world. And here's Corcubion. That's the previous plans and the sketches. <coughs> Redención, refurbishment. It's very small house. 80 square meters into floors. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicoletta and Roque. I think you could have started from the end and go to the beginning. <laughs> you could have worked on both sides. <laughs> um, next, I want to introduce Jose Maria Capelan. Jose Maria is a founder of a collective of many, many architects and designers that originate in Madrid and New York. Many seek multiple influences to generate diverse responses to projects. Thank you, Rachel. Um, my name is uh, Jose. Hold on just a second. I'm just going to share my screen. Just a second. Oops. I don't know. 
What did I do here? There you go. Right. There you go. Um, well, we are many. We were originated basically in Columbia University. We were, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. We were uh, basically originated in New York. Uh, my partner was David Del Villar, who was also a friend while we were in the uni in university. And we started many, many stands for Madrid and New York. Uh, once I came back to Madrid, we, uh, we stayed working together and we stayed, uh, stayed um, sharing projects and trying to do the best things we could, right? Um, um, I have brought two samples of work that uh, we find, we came up with them from 2016, basically. One of them is a kind of a large scale. They're both in the private sector. Um, one is a housing project, hold on, hold on a second. Yeah. One, it's a housing project, and the other one is a retail design and rollout. Uh, we are also like Roque and, and Nicoletta in the, in the retail sector, uh, trying to, to do design and global rollout, right? Uh, the first project is a housing project. It's almost a social housing project in Valladolid, in my hometown. It's a very small land plot, as you can see here, it's close to the railroad, and it's also surrounded by several streets. Um, like the la there were two land plots, as you can see here. One is this one, and the other one was this one that we tried to unify, right? It's a very small land plot of 20 by 20 that was very restricted in every way that you could see. I would say uh, in construction way, it was very restricted. Our The commissioner, our client was also the builder. So he was also asking us to build it with in, in the old traditional brick buildings. So everything was very tight. And we finally came up with, a, I believe is a very nice solution for social housing, which is um, we divided the land, we divided the building in two sides. One was underground and the other one was on top of the ground. Uh, under one was uh, built with um, concrete wall panels in order to be able to hold at least nine cars underground. And then on the top, there was like a Tetris of housing, of, of, of social housings that could work. And all of them, or most of them, will try to have their own garden. Um, if you can see them, right? Uh, this is kind of a building work trying to to come uh, down to the garage, right, to the to the building, and this is like the connection between all the housings on the top, right. Um, this was uh, one of uh, our our um, uh, goals was to try to building in the in the way in the traditional way of this hometown, trying to find something different. So we tried to first um, have a very uh, clean facade with uh, with the construction of the buildings trying to trying to do something different in the brick itself and trying to to if, if you see the each for every three bricks there's one coming to the inside right that farther when you see the sun coming into it it's like a different shade right um, these are some pictures of the interior. It was a large. It was the largest scale that we have had in the last ten years, right? And another project, uh, which is interesting, it's a retail project that is one project for thirty-three locations. So it has to have a very um, added value, I would say. I'm sorry, I haven't spoken English like Rocket for a long time, and uh, and. <laughs> <laughs> my vocab, it's been, you know, awful. Anyway, once you come to an, it, Sanicor is an orthopedic um, business. Once you come to an orthopedic in Spain, you find this. It's a lot of, a lot of stuff, too many, like you see too many rooms. Everything is like awful. You, you, just, you just want to run out of there. And uh, these are two samples of, of, of locations that we worked on. Um, we tried to find 
a better place. We tried to find an orthopedic space that could look for something that you would like to go, that you could see everything with a different face. Uh, disabled people like, or disabled, like wheelchairs or, or stuff that's, that is used for, let's say disabled, which are not, but like a more common space, more interesting space. And also versatile enough to be able to, to work for 33 different locations, right? So this was the first one. You see there are side furniture all around the uh, sales area and then several stuff in the middle. This is the area, you see this, it finally came out with a very nice location for, for the meaning of it. And it's also a clinical place where you can go to the doctor and have your own commission in there. This is another location they like rolling out the same project, right? A third location, this is the first one is Seville, second one is in Huelva, which is in South Spain. Third one is in Granada. And the fourth one was in Almeria. And we're still working on them. We're trying to develop the same concept. Every day is coming to, to a new thing. These are like the place where you try the clothing on, the lockers, you know? and, uh, and this, this is a very ongoing project since 2015. We're still going on. We're working now on the 10th location. And yeah, it's a very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for showing us 33 projects in seven minute lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a world record. <laughs> Our next presenter is Klaus Ransmeyer. Klaus is a partner and design director at the German architecture studio HEN that is based in Berlin. Klaus is leading award-winning project worldwide that he will present today. Thanks, Charlie. Um, Sharing my screen, one second. Um, so first of all, I have to thank also Johnny for organizing this. I think that's a great uh, idea that uh, after 15 years, we managed to see each other uh, in this format and to share each other's work. Uh, it's been quite a while and um, I don't know if you guys know how I look like, that's me. Um, I didn't change too much, I hope. Lost some hair, but besides that, I still think I look the same. Um, since actually graduation from Colombia, um, I've moved actually to Berlin where I'm still based. So I, I worked in uh, New York for uh, a few years after that at Asymptote Architecture, which I'm not going to go into now. But um, after that, I moved to Berlin and I joined um, three close friends that actually founded a studio here in Berlin called Hen Studio B. And uh, Studio B for a reason, because it was like the design studio in a very small scale for a larger office, um, HEN, that exists already for multiple years. Um, HEN itself is, yeah, a big company. Um, it's uh, 360 employees, uh, 40 nationalities, a lot of different clients, 360 plus realized projects. And uh, what um, actually my job when I joined the company was, together with Martin, who is sitting here in the front, um, that's me here, and two other ones, one is here in the back and the other one is over there, to basically um, give the whole uh, office a bit of a new design direction, a new conceptual direction, because um, it was actually going in a very, let's say, yeah, not so contemporary way. So what they actually focused on in expertise was basically all different typologies you can think of from culture to high rise, automotive industry, that which was the core industry that we were working in, health offices, master plans, leisure, education, and science. So the whole portfolio. And um, what is actually interesting in Germany in contrast to some other uh, countries that they uh, not only basically provide all of the architectural services, but also all the construction services. So we have construction management, quantity surveying, all of that stuff in-house. So it's a quite heavy competence and full range of service that we provide. And uh, what actually combines all of those things is that we say we believe in the power and impact of ideas. So anything we do, we try to do with uh, some unique ideas and some unique way of thinking for a project. And 
what I picked here and what I want to present is actually three different projects that show that approach in very different ways. All of those which I was um, leading from actually the first sketch to the end of uh, construction and accordingly very different kind of scales and also typologies. The first one was actually the first one I uh, worked on that was in the year 2009 when we started actually developing it. Um, it's the, called the Porsche Pavilion in Wolfsburg, Germany. And what it is, is actually a sculpture that the former head of Volkswagen, Mr. Ferdinand Pirch, who is the grandson of Ferdinand Porsche, who was actually the founder and developer of Porsche. Um, he wanted to actually build this building for his 80th birthday. And uh, it needed to be something special. And uh, the way that we basically approached it is similar to a car body. We um, developed a monocoque structure together with a, a Dutch um, a company producing ships originally and um, produced to kind of like highlight that it's a special and a luxurious product, everything out of uh, stainless steel. So the whole building that you see here that looks actually like concrete is out of um, stainless steel in some parts where the tension and the structure is heavy loaded, uh, about 10 centimeters thick, uh, thick. So it's about 150 tons of, of stainless steel that was 3D welded and molded and, 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 and grinded and sandblasted at the end. All of this kind of developing a shell for an interior space where there's nothing displayed, but all of the historic models that Porsche was actually designing up to this point and then the latest and current models that are basically for sale now. Um, all of this is embedded in a very large park in Wolfsburg where if you buy like a Volkswagen car, you can pick it up here and basically drive out of it. So all of the backdrop was developed by the company Hen uh, I'm in now uh, multiple years back. So this was the last remaining piece, the last remaining brand to be basically represented in that park. The second project, um, uh, one that has been um, opened uh, about four years ago is for the German-based uh, retailer Zalando. It's an online retailer which uh, turns out to be um, the second largest uh, online clothing retailer in Europe. I think it's just, um, uh, I think just Zara is bigger or something like that. So um, what they did was they were growing very heavily over the first years and they needed a headquarter which is actually based in Berlin and we won a competition um, that um, yeah, um, shows a very unique design, basically, in a way that it reinterprets the classic Berlin block that usually has like introverted courtyards. And they basically um, uh, cut out those courtyards to the outside to reveal the uh, work environments that are happening to people that pass by to everybody around. And that also then leave the remaining block uh, elements as some kind of like translucent, shiny um, um, industrial glass uh, facades. Uh, what the speciality of this project was is that it actually combined the three disciplines that Zalando is focusing on. So that's the design, the branding, and the technology. And all of them needed a place where they can come together, where they can gather, uh, where they can uh, exchange ideas. So that's why the whole interior atrium and the interior space is basically uh, a place for people to hang out, to uh, also work in a very informal way, and to not actually give uh, a certain building, um, let's say, design uh, upon the employees, but to allow the employees to brand and develop um, the, the space as they wish. So basically, it's a very neutral backdrop when it comes to the color and material choice, and uh, we allow people to basically then create their own work environments as they wish. So you see here on the left side, seems to be that the person is really into wooden boxes. That's how they basically then reshape and make it, make it their own. Um, there is these uh, so-called special spaces, living zones or living rooms actually as they're called. That's where uh, you can get your coffee, your, your lunch and um, basically yeah, meet and greet uh, people. The last project I show um, is something that we um, opened about or finished about two years ago, a very complicated project, but um, I think it turned out very nice. It's for the pharmaceutical company Merck. Um, it's in Darmstadt, also in Germany. And what they actually do is Merck is having a patent on 
uh, liquid crystal, which is the, the substance that is used in all of um, LED and L, uh, and uh, yeah, screens basically, right? So they make a really a tons of money with that, and um, they need a space to um, get people, scientists, and people together to develop new products. So that's why they approached us and said, we want to build an uh, innovation center. And the way that we actually um, approached this topic is we said, you need a building that is open, that is actually not um, um, having walls that separate different functions. It needs to be something that is a, a spatial continuum that is vertically stretching throughout the whole building. So we came up with an idea of an uh, origami model that you actually pull apart. And with this model, you generate platforms where people can work, where people can also overlook other levels of um, you know, uh, the building, where they can uh, have certain visual connections between the individual teams that are working on, on, on new projects and new uh, innovations and ideas, and accordingly um, come up with um, the things that perhaps you know, shape our society in the future. And accordingly, it's actually areas of concentration and communication that are in a very strong tension um, between each other. Um, here's a view of the central atrium that is actually stretching through. The whole building is um, uh, exposed uh, concrete. Um, all of the structure and everything is uh, actually um, blast proof because it's next to a, a chemical factory. So in case the chemical factory explodes, the building needs to stay. So all of the concrete you see here is packed with steel and everything you need to make it actually uh, stable. Here's Can another impression. Sorry about yes. that. So for the last slide, here's another view where you look up the building or here towards the workspaces and a view down onto the working areas. Uh, and the last view up uh, through the big central stair that connects all the levels. Thank you. Thank you, Cloud. Sands off for these complex project and scope. Um, <laughs> next, I would like to introduce uh, Pablo Vaquero. Pablo is an architect, artist, and fabrication designer. His main interest is uh, the innovation of modeling system of emergence and biological procedures. I forgot to switch out the microphone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, let me put this for the screen. <clears throat> Basically, um, I I wanted to start by uh, saying that I that I graduated from Columbia two thousand six, and then uh, I I decided to like continue doing some some work in some architectural offices and then I moved to Barcelona to, to do my PhD here in Barcelona uh, and I finished 2006 and I've been uh, teaching and I wanted to show uh, some um, uh, projects that we have developed uh, within some workshops of uh, uh, inside the, the Master of Biodigital where I've been teaching and then also with my partner, we have created a, 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 a group uh, in, in, in Thessaloniki, in Greece, that is about uh, the, the combination of, of how you get the students into the, into the industry. Most of the time, uh, what, what we see is also that they don't really have the, the right type of approach to, to get to see what type of services most of the companies for the fabrication is especially the undergrad and the master people uh, students. So basically what I, what, I, what we have created is like a type of a uh, network of, of different companies which they offer their own fabrication uh, services like uh, laser cutting, 3D printing and different uh, fabrication services. So what, what, what we have uh, combined is, is, uh, is, uh, is like a series of workshops. In this workshop we have a bring all of these uh, companies to, 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 to explain how they can give services to the students and which are the future clients as, as, as an architecture students. Uh, lately, I'm also uh, joining uh, uh, a group of, of, of uh, 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 research in, in, in Saudi Arabia. 
uh, especially or, um, orientated on uh, fabrication design. Uh, and this is a, a professor that is a, a, in mathematics and uh, is completely uh, experimenting with uh, architecture uh, projects, uh, especially from the mathematics perspective and the geometrical perspective. He is based on uh, South Arabian coast and what, uh, I will be joining this team uh, next September. And let me just describe a few, few projects. Uh, this is um, uh, a workshop that I have been, that I have taught in 2014 in, in Athens with my partner in which we have constructed this project. Um, this project has been, has been constructed uh, within a, uh, a workshop that we have organized with 28 students with, uh, which is made of a uh, beams of aluminum and a locobond and still uh, laser coated uh, uh, extrusions and connectors then uh, these are the pieces this this was like 120 uh, beams and 40 extrusions which are folded with a locobond and then connected with screws with, between them. Uh, we had some uh, uh, this, uh, problems in, in the in the legs, but we have fixed with we have fixed it with some uh, connectors in the bottom because of the uh, relaxation method that we had used for for the for the for the design. But um, but basically we have a we have managed to get to get it constructed at the end. Then uh, the other project is orientated with uh, with the design processes that are uh, inspired by biological uh, patterns, and this is especially the the, the diffusion reaction, which is a a paper that we have also written about how how do you uh, get uh, to design base of 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 the limb, the limbs of the of the biology and how the the the, the stripes of of, of these uh, materials are are generated so basically what we have been doing is is to com combine this uh, method of of, of of designing of, of, from biological perspectives, combining the structurality with it, with, with them. So these are some stress morphologies uh, projects that we have been also teaching in Thessaloniki with some um, projects by students. <clears throat> these are uh, a stri uh, stripe stri uh, methods to to construct a, a different type of uh, designs. These are projects from students from different workshops that we have been teaching in Thessaloniki. Then um, this is the, sometimes they lamp, sometimes they design a uh, furniture, they design buildings, which which is uh, something that um, that we have been very open on on, on these workshops. All of these students, this is, this is very open to most of the architecture or from the master degree or from the undergrad uh, undergrad students from the Thessaloniki Architecture School. <clears throat> then uh, this, uh, this is inside the biodigital architecture master in which uh, we have been teaching with, uh, with, with, with my wife also in, 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 in Barcelona, uh, which is about connecting uh, different materials. Uh, here we are combining some CNC techniques on, the, on, on a base form and a 3D printed piece as a connector and then uh, a laser, laser cutter, laser cutted stripes uh, uh, with, with screw connectors. So basically uh, these are um, methods of, 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 of combining the, the, um, the, the stripes morphologies to be able to construct very complex forms 
And this is a, a method that, that we have been teaching in the master for already five years. <clears throat> then this is a, the same method with different topologies, but uh, in, a, in, in another year. Uh, then uh, we have been also invited to teach to to teach you know, to to to, um, uh, to expose a, 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 a project to for the entrance of the art uh, galleries international ga art galleries in the um, in the center of the Saloniki. Uh, and we have constructed this element which grabbed their attention. Then uh, this is by waving and connecting with with the uh, 200 stripes with polypropylene. What we have to see is the the most structural uh, organization of the stripes to be able to orientate uh, the the segmentation. And this is the arc at the end. This is in the International Contemporary Art Fair. Although we passed eight minutes, eight, if you can conclude, so thank you. Basically, yes, this is what it is. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Um, that's that's what it is. <laughs> Thank you, Pablo, for connecting practice with teaching. Our next presenter is Nancy Saraki. Nancy is a principal of Archivirus, an architecture and design firm based in Greece that operates through research, experimentation, and dialogue with the environment. Hi, guys. Hope you're all doing well in these weird times we're experiencing at the moment. Uh, let me share the screen. Can you all see? Can everybody see? Hello? No, we cannot. I share the screen. Maybe try to stop sharing and then we share. Okay, it's a PowerPoint presentation. So, We're not able to see it, Nancy. You can send it to me and I can help. Because now it's a full screen on me. Um, your connection is not uh, is not great. I suggest that you let can send me, me the presentation and we can get back to you. I can run the presentation for you and you will speak. Where I send it to you? Uh, I'll send you an email in the chat. And we'll move uh, to someone else and, uh, and I'll reintroduce you later. Does that okay. make sense? Because we are not able to hear you well. Okay, so Nancy will get back to you. Uh, send me the presentation. I'll, I'll, I'll send you my email address and I will help you uh, run it. Okay, I apologize for this. Uh, we are moving forward with uh, Ricardo Bas uh, Bastos Areas. Ricardo is the founding partner of Studio Can that is based in the north of Portugal. They work across multiple building types, including in the healthcare and the industrial sectors. Hi guys, nice to see you all. Uh, thank you, Rochelle, for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna go forward to my presentation. Okay. Can you all see? Could you see anything, anything or no? No? No, uh, Leslie, Leslie, can you troubleshoot this please? The two presenters are not able to share a screen. 
Mm, let me see. Um, the let me try again. Hold options on. are okay. Let me see if you can. Yes. Okay. Now, now you can see. Yes. Okay. Um, so if you're all, so, um, as I as I said, my name is Ricardo, and we we after Columbia University when we left um, when we left New we we left school we stayed in New York me and my wife Maria for uh, next two or three years we we came back in two thousand and nine and we started this this office called Studio Can which is me Maria and another partner we had in in Guimarães we have in Portugal which is Miguel and so fifteen years passed. Uh, we had through our office like 15, 15 architects going through. It's a very small office, or it's a it's a nice office considering uh, Portuguese size, but it's a small office considering uh, Mumbai or New York. So in fifteen years, we had about we did about one hundred and fifty designs, and um, I'm going to show you fifteen projects, fifteen highlights on the projects that we we done, starting from some small range to some other 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 bigger bigger things, not as big as, as, as some projects that we saw already. So the first one I'm gonna show you is this mountain cabin that we started, that we started doing it from, uh, from a, a container ship. And we started cutting it to make this um, cabin in the woods in the north of Portugal. So the clients just wanted just one of a cabin so they could go spend a weekend in the middle of nowhere. We did another private house. And the thing, this is another private house we did in Portugal. The thing with, that we tried to experiment with, or we, we still do, is with the materiality and the effect of the material and uh, on, the, on, the, on the context and on the, on the purpose itself. So the other one, as you saw, the, the cabin, the, the the surface was made out of um, cork. This one is, uh, is uh, this private house is based in, in Aveiro, which is a, a coastal town in Portugal. And what we did is we, we, had, we had it built out of exposed concrete, deactivated exposed concrete that made it look like, like uh, it was built out of, out of sand. This is another project we did, which is a renovation from an old farmhouse in the middle of a vineyard in the mountains, also in the north of Portugal. It 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 went from a from a from a farmhouse to a five bedroom, no seven bedroom house. You can see the materials are local materials, local stone. Concrete again, exposed concrete. Interiors are also exposed concrete floors. Very brutal. It's very uh, rough. We could say another farmhouse renovation we did. It's uh, another house. It's very close to the seashore, also in the north of Portugal, where we're based. This was an old house with a factory and with a with a, a water mill because it's like in a, in an island. So this, uh, the, the, the chimney you see was from the older, older factory. For another client, we did um, Lego house. Lego house, which we started from a, a software that's, that, that Lego has. And uh, we started designing it on the software itself that they have it online. So the client said, okay, so then I want to I want to purchase the model. I want to have it fabricated by Lego and have it purchased. So we started working with the model from the Lego software, and then it ended up like a private residency uh, project. Then we did a lot of um, restaurants. I want to show you a couple of ones. This is a restaurant in Porto, in the city center of Porto, uh, in Portugal, which is a bar and the restaurant 
which we transform the small small plot into to make it look like it's a it's a it's a bigger bigger restaurant through the effect of an entire glass wall that that doubles the space as you can see on these pictures so one of the walls is completely made out of glass glass i mean not glass mirror another restaurant we did in Braga, another town in Portugal, Japanese restaurant. It was a collaboration with a Japanese uh, artist that actually lives in New York right now. This building is also in the north of Portugal. This is like a, this is a hotel and a senior senior uh, residence. This was already we were already working on this project when we were at Columbia at the time. So the materiality again, this is all clad with copper, non-varnished non copper, so it would age uh, with the building itself. And being a uh, senior citizen's um, uh, hotel and residence, it's like a metaphor to the, to, the, to the good aging. And we did a competition. It was not really a competition because we were the only competitors, but it was a client in Algeria. And uh, we did the, this, uh, this uh, hotel, shopping center, and uh, housing complex in Algeria. When we went from the, the Algerian uh, uh, memories and the Kasbah, the, the, the town itself, this was the plot that we had to work with. So this is the final project, which is a big complex with housing, shopping center, and the hotel. Some other apartments for studies for, for, for housing in Portugal. Some sketches. Then we're also working in renovation. This is an old castle in the north of Portugal. As you can see, this, this river separates Portugal from Spain. On the left side is Spain, the right side is, is Portugal. This is a 70, 700 year old uh, uh, castle fortress uh, that um, was already a hotel and we were, we are to renovate it. It's under, under renovation now, or no, we're still working on design development, but, but it's gonna start soon. So this is an old castle. And we had to introduce some things, change inside, yeah, modernize it because it was a hotel from the seventies. We also work for food retail surfaces. So this is an example of a, of a, of a food retailer. This is the, the, the building under construction right now. This is a motel. Uh, we're working also on this project for a client. It's also here in the north of Portugal. It's a project we're working on for the, for the, the it's a public, it's a public project. It's a um, healthcare center. We're also working it now. It's, it's, it's supposed to be built out of blue concrete. And in the end, you know, you can also do your own house. So this is a project we did for us. This is an old factory that we, we renovated, an old, an old storehouse that uh, me and my wife renovated for ourselves. So this is actually where we, where we live. Also, I have some slides from the heritage that we got from the, the, the school and the heritage from New York. From the school, we run an, an art space. We run an art space that, um, that uh, has a restaurant, that has a gallery. We work with um, Yehuda Safran, a former, former faculty member of, of Columbia University of GSAPP. And uh, we also got his, uh, his library in our art center. So he comes here to visit sometimes, he is, gives lectures. We also participate in a book written by him, Yehuda Safran. So he, he wrote a piece on, on a work from us. In our art center, we have concerts, dance, performance, exhibitions. And uh, what we inherited from the six on six at, at, uh, at Columbia was also this street parties with, that we do in our, in our building with the, the artist community and architecture community. 
Thank you. So I chose to present uh, two interior projects, uh, residential ones. Actually, the one was uh, right after my graduation in 2007, and the other one 10 years later. Uh, they are both of them quite particular because uh, the client's uh, demand, uh, it was a little bit like uh, very unique. So. Uh, the Ram House, that was actually my first uh, project, a realized project. Um, the client uh, requested a skatable habitat, uh, where uh, she could skate. Uh, so, um, I, I eliminated the... I, I, I just wanted to make a Ram House and not a house with a ramp. Uh, so my goal was uh, the skate element to be adopted in every possible way. Uh, and uh, so I imagined the space in which uh, straight lines would become uh, curved and uh, flat surfaces would become rubs or balls. Uh, and aspects of daily life would adopt the feeling of acceleration, which is actually the main... Uh, uh, the main... Um, element of skateboarding. Uh, so the plan uh, is like very simple since it was like a, an addition to an already house or so was in the top of a building. So the living room uh, becomes a mini ramp and turns into a bowl to create a partition with the, with the, uh, with the bedroom and the bathroom. So we see here like uh, everyday elements like uh, cooking in the kitchen uh, uh, can coexist with skating. We see the living room, uh, people hiking out on the balcony. Uh, the living room becomes uh, a skating park. Uh, behind, the, uh, behind the wooden ram uh, is uh, revealed the fireplace and storage places. We see the partition with the bedroom and the bathroom. The fireplace. And actually the highlight of this project, which uh, I'm really proud uh, to get this email from one of the most famous skaters in the whole world, Tony Hawk, as you most have heard of him. So I had an email that he was visiting Greece for vacation and he found that there is this uh, ram house in Greece somewhere in Athens. So he contacted me and came to the house to skate it. So this was a little video, I hope. That's a problem. You can watch it. I don't know if you can see. It's on vacation, but we heard about a house that was built for the sake of skating architecturally. Designed for skaters, supposedly. We found on the internet. We made some calls. We're gonna check it out. Here we are, the house of ramps and transition. I don't think it's been written in a while. And I'm kind of nervous about the dishes and the plastic screens around. But. Movement in the apartment, 
Uh, so this, uh, this actually, this passage was transformed like in a, a passage through different time periods. Uh, it didn't touch anything. It was it stayed and spoiled with the old wallpaper and the vintage furniture. Uh, and then walking into the living room uh, where we kept the same floor, uh, the fireplace uh, was transformed with uh, more more modern uh, uh, lines, but we kept the same wood. Uh, the shelves uh, were made from the same wood that we found back in the 70s. And then uh, as we walk uh, along the kitchen dining area, uh, there is this, um, uh, this blurry point where the old meets the new uh, and the modern dominates the scene with a high-end kitchen. While we move into the more private areas of the house, uh, where we still find fragments of the past. So the sanitary and the mirror uh, are all kept uh, from uh, the apartment that, that uh, we found. And so there is this blend between the old and the new. The doors remain as spoiled, as you see. And also the, uh, the bell, uh, some, uh, some parts stayed completely unspoiled. Uh, so th the goal is that the final scene uh, will keep uh, evolving uh, as the time passes. So that's uh, my two projects with 10 uh, years uh, difference. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Okay, it's thank you. Very special clients. <laughs> That's we, all, we all want your clients. <laughs> um, if you can stop sharing, please. I see myself multiple times. Oh, that's better. Thank you. Last but not least, Adriana Jackie, we're going to try again. Adriana, can you hear me? We're not able to hear you, Adriana. Are you there? About now. Yes. Yes. Perfect. I can hear, and I hear myself too. Wow, this is going to be exciting. <laughs> um, okay. So let's see. Anybody can see? Yes, it looks great. Okay. Well, what have I been up to for the last? Wow, 15 years. When we left, I left New York. I moved to Detroit, Michigan, because as all you know, I'm married. And he had to do residency. So I was kind of dragged to wherever he landed. Also, my story, it has a lot of immigration tied to it because I immigrated from Venezuela and I had to go through many visas to finally get a permanent residence, which took 10 years. I I started working at a firm in Detroit, then 2008 came. We all got laid off and everybody knows how 2008 went. I had my first kid. 
which is Julia, which you saw in the pictures, which is now 12. I lived in Washington State, um, Yakima, and it was a um, major producer of hops, which is one of the main elements for beer, which we're in. The, um, this is a small town, by the way, 100,000 people. Um, and the clients came to, to me at the time. I, I did a design build firm. I, I had a GC license because since I wasn't a licensed architect. And what I liked to do the most was residential and like commercial. I went through the GC licensing route. And also because I love to control every aspect of the so I had a lot of trades um, under under me and that I had to um, coordinate. And so this project in particular um, was a client that was, so we made uh, the brewery that you could see it walking out from the street. So it's kind of a of, of an entertainment for the city as you walk by. This is in the heart of the downtown. And you could see how here they made um, all the beers and you could see it through the windows as you pass by and then come in and um, we'll have a nice drink. Can you hear, still hear me, Raheli? Um, in that sense, I continued on with a mostly residential um, where I combined uh, procurement of uh, furniture and the tiles and um, every finish. So I became, my business model became between a retail store, uh, GC and an, and an architect. But in this country, I can't say I'm an architect because I'm still not licensed. So I'm an interior designer, architect, all rolled into one. Um, this was a 4,000 square foot project that had it was in a, a, a full house, um, new build. Um, then I, we moved to Miami, Washington. I'm, I'm sorry, to Miami, Florida. Um, oh, this is my last project in, uh, um, sorry, in Yakima, Washington. It was uh, a design center for Lexar. Lexar builds homes um, and they wanted a, a design center where they can bring their clients in and have uh, all their finishes in the back and offices to uh, meet their clients. So it's still almost finished. This is some before it um, got constructed. Um, I'm gonna skip this because I'm probably on over time. This is Miami, Florida. I, we moved and I had to start basically from scratch because my network here is not that big. So it takes, as you all, you all know, time to build. Um, I concentrated more on residential because here I do not have a GC license. I decided to pursue my architect license. So I've been studying for that. And um, I paired up with many wonderful GCs down here. Um, this, and I also procure furniture in this interior design business. As I was saying, I put all these um, rooms together with every single accessory and piece that you see in the photos. Um, this was our, our, my last um, project. It was an office space for a branding a company. They do marketing of all sorts of things. And they had a very tight, um, a, a lot of cubicles for them to work without being stuffy and have a center table for them to put all their graphics out when they need it or, um, or, or uh, extra stations for their interns. Uh, I don't know if I'm in the eight minutes for Heli now, but um, this is it. Thanks for the opportunity. It's wonderful to see everybody. You're muted, Rahali. You're muted. Yeah, it happens when I talk to myself, but thank you, Adriana. And, um, you know, amazing that you work in multiple trades and very impressive. Um, I'm glad that we all are able to participate. Uh, we don't have enough time. So basically, 
I'm going to have one question that I hope that as many of you can answer. Um, I guess is what, you know, the, the GSAP experience of 2006, what do you feel was the most important thing that you took back home and to build your practice? Friendship. Can you repeat that question, please? <laughs> I can't hear anyone. Roque or smile, there's an answer there. <laughs> Can hear you. Yes, yes. I have a, the best thing from Colombia. It was Nicoletta. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> of course. No doubt. I, I think something great was being exposed to such great talent. Like everyone here, we've seen all the projects, right? And that, that obviously gives us uh, confidence, you know, that we've been together and we've seen so many ideas come through. So I don't see that, you know, when we're doing projects, we don't stop. I just, I, I feed off of everyone's energy, everything that I was exposed to, all the conversations we had, the friendships and things. It was, it was really, really a good. I remember also to be in a downtown in a party and with uh, thinking, okay, I want to go to the school to work first time in my life, <laughs> you know? because it was very nice, really, really. And the best thing, a part of Nicoletta, of course, it was the Greek parties. <laughs> yes. <It> was, wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, you know, something that it's interesting, it, it was like a, a truly an incubator before the term was popular. You know, when we were in school, nobody was talking about an incubator, but that's what really what it is. It's a tight space extremely compact where you have so many people living there and testing different ideas and that you know creates that friction uh, of interesting things to happen so i don't think at the time the term incubator was popular but i think that's uh, really the way <clears throat> i can think of it the other thing that was amazing when i look back is the lecture series that we had and when it was superb every wednesday to see some of, you know, growing up like an idol, you know, like whoever you were thinking of, you could see like, you know, 20 feet away from you. And that kind of, in a way, demystify the person. Like say, think about, I don't know, Jean Nouvel, right? We, you know, <clears throat> he was presenting at our school and he, you know, I know also you see his flaws. It wasn't actually a great presentation. And that's what I like about him. Like you say, hey, this is Jean Nouvel and quite the presentation wasn't something amazing. Uh, it was a good presentation, but among others that we had. So we had the ability of having those lecture series that were uh, unbelievable. Sahadid, you name it. Whoever you were thinking that we may have, it was available and, uh, and there. Not to mention the, you know, the seminars, you know. So, so the, um, the talent, as Stephen mentioned, in addition to also the faculty and guests that we had, it was out of this world. Fantastic. Um, also, the, the last term, the travel, that was amazing. <laughs> but I think yeah. what we all what we all have in common, and we still is that I mean, in so, at some point we all still in touch. We we do have a WhatsApp group. I either we talk or not, but you're there. You can see, you can talk, you can see where everybody is, uh, what everybody is up to. We're still in touch through Facebook, Instagram, or whatever social network that it's on at the moment and i think that is one of the great things of, uh, of colombia we just we created a, a network of people who actually it was you know it was a connection of things the year the people and then the able the availability to to keep in touch right yeah i don't know yeah Anyone like else wants to join the conversation <laughs> before we end? We have two more minutes. Uh, yeah, I agree with all of them. And I just um, must say that mainly, mainly, mainly all, all the connections and all the relationships that we formed while, while we were there 
and um, the experience with being with each other, I think it was the most, the most we got out of it. Um, of course, as, as you saw in my presentation, we got some connections with teachers that come to Portugal with uh, this library that we got from Yehuda. The, the, um, the, we got, um, even we had an exhibition of, of artists that we met in, in, in New York. Uh, so all those connections of being in the city and being at, uh, at Columbia um, are still going through time. So I think all of that makes a big difference. Yeah, I think New York is really important personally for me, the idea of this multicultural experience um, that got me introduced to all of you, but the city as a whole, as, uh, you know, the food, the variety of food, the variety of, of culture experiences, lectures and galleries and shows, it's all kind of coming together into a really amazing experience. Um, wow. Our session is, is concluding. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the panelists. I hope we'll stay in touch. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Thank, thank you, Rickley. Thank you very much. And we'd like thank to in uh, invite everyone to join uh, session three, which will start at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Um, and Leslie, if you want to have um, concluding words, no, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I'm sure that our students and incoming students as well as alumni are enjoying to hear how you have um, translated your time at GSAP into your thriving practices today and, and all the different countries that you practice in in the different cities. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we will be uploading a recording of this um, and hope to stay in touch with you through either mentorship <clears throat> programs or other ways to, for you to contribute to Life at GSAP. So I'll, I'll send an email to all of you um, following this. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Nice. Bye. Very nice to meet everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.